Hello, this is Chiak, and we are back with Danganronpa 2, uh, the If novel, or the extra content, the If light novel, which this should be chapter 5. And then I'd imagine I'm going to be reading the epilogue, is just going to be contained within this one set. Either way, let's get started. Computer room's innermost area, Monokuma room. How much time had passed? The surveillance cameras at the gates were capturing footage of countless monokumas falling at the hands of a child who fought like a raging demon. The monokumas bolstered their numbers, and now hundred and now hundred of them were trying to sink their claws into Mukuro. Most of them were running on autopilot, reacting to her movements based on prior information they had received in advance. But despite standing before hundreds of mechanical adversaries, Mukuro's face showed no fear. She hadn't sustained a single injury, giving her a presence that was nearly divine to behold. Though Sakura Ogami was powerful enough to injure her arm, Mukuro in her current state could potentially fight Sakura to a draw now, without relying on firearms. She took complete control of the battlefield, ticking in her surroundings as if they were a part of herself. She dodged attacks from the rear as though she had eyes on the back of her head and stabbed through Monokuma's weak points with a metal bar. No matter where the attacks came from, Mukuro deflected them all as if her skin were covered in eyes. Describing her as ultimate no longer did her justice. Mukuro had transcended the boundaries of humanity and, and becoming a pure and becoming a pure king killing machine. Becoming or became? I feel like there's, there's some grammatical error there. A minor one, mind you. But despite that, even though she understood the ludicrous power her sister possessed, Junko was not afraid. She felt not one iota of fear. <laughs> After all, all Junko can feel is despair. She even started to admire her sister's attempt to fill her with despair, but that sentiment quickly filled Junko with an orgastic ecstasy of despair. Junko knew. She knew that Mukuro was neither hope nor despair. She was just a phenomenon. A disappointing girl who no longer understood herself, who only knew how to be violent because it was all she could believe in anymore. Mukuro had become an avatar of destruction beyond that of any military force. She couldn't even be considered a soldier anymore. She was a natural disaster, like a typhoon or a tornado. Or perhaps like gravity. She was now a fundamental force of the universe that only existed to bring despair to Junko. The mastermind enjoyed watching her sister go all out. If Mukuro destroyed everything and ruined her life, Junko would still be comforted by the despair. She could just go right ahead and overpower her. Junko considered this for a few seconds until a familiar hopeless habit reared its head. Her habits of getting so bored that it made her sick. The girl who had been grinning as she watched the screen now bore a look of calm sto stoicism and she reached for the microphone connected to Monokuma's speakers. Mukuro was no longer human anymore, but Junko knew how to bring her back. It was a simple feeling, really. And with that hopeless feeling for Mukuro in mind, the mastermind said just one word. Mukuro. Mukuro. I kind of forgot how to. <laughs> what what is what was Junko's? I know fashionista Junko's voice, but what was the spare Junko's voice? Anyway, though that character was a lot. <laughs> anyway, in front of the main entrance, Mukuro. That voice. It was calling her name. Instead of using Monokuma's voice filter, Junko's natural voice was coming out of Monoku Mo coming out of a Monokuma unit. That's all it took. With one word, Mukuro Ikusaba stopped being a force of nature and became a person again. 
Monokuma would not miss this opportunity. As if moving to the beat of Mukuro's shaking heart, a torrent of claws leapt to attack her. But Mukuro trusted her instincts and twisted her entire body to fend off the attacks, leaving her with only a few scrapes here and there. But the despair wasn't over yet. The ultimate despair didn't waste any time making her next move. Mukuro, watch out. Huh? As soon as Mukuro heard that voice, her mind went completely blank. There was no mistaking it. That was Muk. That was Makoto's scream. Oh wait, oh, Makoto. Mukuro, watch out! <laughs> huh? As soon as Mukuro heard that voice, her mind went completely blank. There was no mistaking it. That was Makoto's voice. Scream. A scream that saved her from the spears of Gunnir and changed her destiny. No, that's wrong. It took her a tenth of a second to realize that voice was just a sound clip that Junko had replayed. But it was more than enough time to drag Mukuro, who had regained her, her humanity, into despair. Right when she recovered from her moment of shock, when the Kuma appeared behind her and Roundhouse kicked her in the Roundhouse kicked her in the temple. She twisted her head to roll with the blow, but at that moment, a different Monokuma attacked her from the opposite side with a headbutt. And as soon as Mukuro dodged that attack, three Monokumas launched simultaneous drop kicks and knocked her to the ground. Ugh. The fact that they weren't using their claws meant they weren't trying to kill Mukuro right away. Before she could stand up again, dozens of Monokumas waiting for her on the floor climbed on top of Mukuro and pinned her limbs. One of the Monokumas waddled over to Mukuro as she lay face down on the floor and laughed. <laughs> a pretty girl getting... Oh, sorry. A pretty girl getting pinned by all these me's. I wonder if I should feel more excited about this. Don't make that face. If I wanted to kill you, I'd just pump you full of bullets right, right now. I don't think the audience watching this on TV would like that ending very much. I need to make sure I do it the right way this time. What are you planning to... What are you planning to do to me? Mikuro asked in her emotionless voice. Monokuma kafad and answered. Nothing. I'm just gonna stick to the original plan and make you play the killing game at this school. I'll erase everyone's memories again, and I'll just make them redo the introduction and the entrance ceremony again. In typical, in typical Monokuma fashion, he leaned his face toward Mukuro. But it'd be boring if we had to redo everything. Maybe this time, I'll have you participate as Mukuro Ikusaba. I'll take away even more of your memories like I did to that irritating detective girl. You'll just be a poor little girl with no memory at all. As Monokuma talked and wiggled his body from side to side, the other Monokumas danced and twirled around. Amid this fantastical scene, Monokuma continued to describe his hopeless plan in a nonchalant manner. At first, you'll be the girl with amnesia, and everyone will feel sorry for you. But as they unravel the mystery of this academy, they'll find out who you really are. It's exciting to think how they'll treat you when that happens. Knowing you, you'll probably kill someone purely on instinct. Maybe I should rethink my rules about self-defense. <laughs> you can't. Her memories would be erased. There was nothing she could do about her classmates hating her, but losing even her childhood memories would mean her connection to Junko would be severed as well. Even if Mukuro had no interest in the world, that was unbearable even for her. I've heard of New Game Plus before, but this is the first time I'll get to see a New Game Minus. Ah, should I tell you up for fun? Or maybe we should make this game even more masochistic. Forget hard mode, very hard mode. <laughs> Forget hard mode, very hard mode, and inferno mode. Wanna just skip ahead to impossible mode? Maybe I'll erase your memories after I drag you on a motorcycle, pummel you with a thousand baseballs, burn you at the stake, and crush you with an excavator. Mikolo knew what Monokuma was talking about. He 
He was describing the tools they had prepared for the various executions they had planned for the students. After everyone reintroduces themselves, they'll walk around the school grounds and eventually find a flat-chested girl with amnesia, covered in bandages with Fenrir tattoos on her right hand. I'd bet a certain fan base might get off on that. If this were a game, that would increase sales by 500%. Though Monokuma sounded like he was joking, everything he said was deadly serious. As evidence, Mukuro heard a rumbling sound off in the distance. Now then, your sweet ride is on its way! Based on the engine's noise, Mukuro surmised that it was the Mukuro surmised that it was the larger motorcycle that was supposed to be used for one of the executions. I took the time to bring this all the way from the punish punishment room, so you better be grateful. The sound of the roaring engine grew louder and louder, like the approaching footsteps of death. Mukuro wondered how Monokuma would drive it with such tiny arms and legs, but then she remembered she was dealing with an ultimate despair. Junko would make the impossible possible, but just to bring about despair. A despair that went hand in hand with Mukuro's fate. Did I fail? I couldn't fill Junko with despair. I couldn't save Makoto and the others. Questions raced through Mukuro's mind, but she wasn't able to answer them. There was no way she could have answered them so easily. After all, she was still alive. The sound of the motorcycle grew closer and closer, as if it was threatening to break Mukuro's spirit. Suddenly, Monokuma stopped moving. The other Monokumas continued doing their automatic movements. As this strange event unfolded, Mukuro noticed something. The motorcycle had suddenly gone quiet. After a few seconds, the engine exploded to life and began to approach even faster than before. Only a few seconds later, what appeared in front of the main entrance was an enormous motorcycle that plowed through groups of Monokumas like a predator hunting its prey. The rider of this motorcycle was none other than Mondo Owada. Mukuro and Monokuma were both visibly shocked by this turn of events. Instead of addressing them, Mondo accelerated the motorcycle he stolen from Monokuma directly toward Mukuro. Just before his front tire touched Mukuro, he popped a reverse wheelie and turned the entire motorcycle around. The back wheel swept over Mukuro's back, knocking away all the Monokumas that were pinning her. Hey, can you stand? Mondo asked and begrudgingly offered his hand to Mukuro. Confused, Mukuro took his hand and stood up. Okay. What are you doing, Mondo? I was so close! One of the Monokumas protested. Actually, it's probably the... Oh, okay. yeah. What are you doing, Mondo? I was so close! One of the Monokumas protested. Not in his normal voice, but as the hacker, the Shiki, Marad Mad Madarai. Oh, yeah. You're the Shiki or whatever, right? That's right. Why are you helping a terrorist? I ain't bragging about this or anything, but I have no clue if you or this girl's lying. The veins in his temple began to bulge, and his cheeks flushed with anger as Mondo said, But still, I ain't the type to just stand around while some idiot gangs up on a girl. What are you saying? Get a hold of yourself. I don't know what the voice I'm using. You must be experiencing Stockholm Syndrome. You've deluded yourself into thinking you're friends with the criminal who's taking you hostage. Monokuma tried to explain to Mondo, but he ignored him, took Mukuro's hand, and pulled her onto the back of the motorcycle. Now shut the fuck up! I don't know nothing about Stockholms or Syndromes, but don't, a <laughs> but don't go acting like you can boss me around! As Mondo shouted, he read the motorcycle as if he was using it to punctuate his words. The ceiling-mounted turrets began moving but the two disappeared before the turrets could take aim at the motorcycle. As they zoomed through the hallways, countless Monokumas chased after them, waving their claws widely through the air. Why? 
asked Mikuro. Huh? shouted Mondo. His voice was even louder than the sound of the engine. Don't get the wrong idea. I don't trust you at all. His he his lord his lord his voice slight he lowered his voice slightly as if he were whispering to himself. But still, I don't know why, but I feel like I could trust what he said. He He inquired Mukuro. But there was no time for questions. The units leading the Monokumas chasing after the motorcycle had almost caught up to them. And then, like the enormous maws of some fearsome creature, they brandished their claws in perfect unison. At that moment, the motorcycle zoomed by a certain girl. A girl whose fighting ability surpassed that of any normal human, the strongest girl on Earth. With a fighting spirit that defied comprehension, the ultimate martial artist kicked off the floor. A sound even louder than the motorcycle engine filled the room. When Mukuro looked back, she saw Sakura landing on the floor, sending the pack of Monokumas flying several meters away. Sakura? If she heard, Mo Mu if she heard Mukuro mumble her name, Sakura didn't acknowledge it. Like a statue of fearsome god, like a statue of a fearsome god king, she calmed her breathing as she stood before the pack of Monokumas, ready for battle. Your pursuit methods seem unbecoming for one who claims to be the ultimate hacker. An overpowering aura seeped from her skin, and her skin shimmered as an intense heat began to fill the hallway. Unlike the power of Mukuro's sheer violence, this was the power of martial arts. Mukuro froze the air around her, and time along with it, a Sakura was generating enough heat to boil space itself as she stood before the Monokumas. With that heat stinging her back, Mukuro looked ahead. Hifumi and Chihiro were cautiously peeking from behind the door leading to the dorms, while Aoi while and Taka kept watch from inside the building. After passing them by, Mondo slowed down the motorcycle as he reached the front of the cafeteria and turned in to a, and turned in to a complete stop. The other students looked warily at Mukuro. But among these students, Mukuro noticed two people who weren't regarding her with suspicion. One was Kyoko, who seemed to be studying the situation. The other one was a skinny boy who was leaning against Kyoko's shoulder. Makoto? Mukuro's lips began to tremble as she sat on the back of the motorcycle. Ignoring the pain coursing through his body, Makoto smiled at Mukuro and repeated what he said to her earlier. I'm glad... I'm glad you're safe, Mukuro. Unfortunately, Mukuro was unable to realize her hope of filling her little sister with despair. Instead, she had successfully planted the seeds of hope into her fellow students. Makoto had barely regained consciousness while Mukuro was fighting the horde of Monokumas at the main entrance. When he woke up, he did something extremely simple. He talked about his memories. Most of the students were still skeptical, even after listening to Mukuro's recorded confession on Chihiro's laptop. Obviously, they were still not entirely convinced at first when Makoto woke up, but after Sakura asked him a certain question, the ambiance completely changed. Hold on, just taking a sip of my... <laughs> I'm actually wondering... I mean, no, this wouldn't, this wouldn't be an epilogue, but... You guys shifting perspective? Okay, I just need to see who's talking here. Hmm. Then beyond the walls of this school, the world is completely destroyed. You're saying there's no one else alive. Makoto slowly sat up to, an sat up to answer Sakura's meek question. Don't worry. I'm sure it can... Kinichiro is still safe. I'm sure he'll still keep his promise to you. Sakura gasped. Kinichiro was the only man she couldn't defeat. A man who had promised her a rematch and made her one other promise as well. How do you know that name? How do you know about that promise? Because you told me. No, 
Makoto slowly corrected himself. You told all of us. Sakura was silent after hearing those words. But she then faced the other students and spoke in a loud, clear voice. I'm going to trust Makoto. Sakura? Though Aoi was shocked, Sakura continued to speak with determination. What Makoto... What Makoto just said is something I kept locked away inside my memories. In fact, I was planning to keep that a secret until the day I died. If I shared that secret, that means there was once a strong bond between Makoto, myself, and with my fellow students as well. Makoto continued to talk in a gentle tone. Though it couldn't have been good for his health, he continued to slowly talk about, his, about the memories that the other students no longer had. <laughs> uh, why do you know about the story I'm planning to write? I don't know who's talking. Would this- no, no, wait. Would this be- Would this be the girl instead? Okay, I'm- No, no, this would- Hmm. No, no, this would be Toko. Sorry, because she stu the, they're stuttering. Why do you know about the story I'm planning to write? Are, are you a specialist Nen user who can predict the, the future? Oh wait, this is... Oh, you know what? <laughs> I don't know. I should just click. <laughs> I should just click continue. Oh, okay, let me go back then. Oh, why do you know about the story I'm planning to write? Are you a specialist Nen user who can predict the future? You already finished that story, Hifumi. You had me help you with inking. What? Uh, wait a sec! How do you know I extorted money from that girl related to the Chess Kuziru clan? Because you even tried to sell my organs to them. His wounds were excruciating. But even so, Makoto kept smiling and talking about their lives together. As if it was his duty to do so now that he had regained his memories. As the other students listened to him, they slowly began to realize something. The vivid accounts he was providing couldn't be explained as just passing knowledge. Clearly, some kind of bond between them all had been erased. So clearly some kind of bond between them all had been erased. Only Byakuya remained cynical. There's no way I would have grown closer to any of you. It's likely that you're all secretly working together. Though Byakuya was still hostile towards Makoto's recollections of their memories, for the time being he determined that Makoto, Makoto wasn't actually a terrorist. Mukuro had bought enough time for Makoto to wake up and share his memories with the others. Even if she hadn't intended to do that, it was still a small sliver of hope that she grasped, grasped tightly. Okay, another change in perspective? And now, as she looked at the boy who had smiled at her, Mukuro didn't know what to say. She couldn't think of anything to say at all. The battle was over and Mukuro was now back to being a disappointing girl. She turned away from everyone's face and apologetically climbed off the back of the motorcycle. But Makoto saw her and slowly opened his mouth to say, Thank you, Mukuro. You saved my life. Makoto gave her words of sincere gratitude between his weak breaths. Mukuro couldn't bring herself to look at him as she mumbled to herself. Why? Huh? If Kyoko told you, then you already know what I did, right? After regaining his memories and learning the truth, Mukuro should have been nothing but a heated traitor to him. Why would he smile at someone like her? Mukuro kept her head down. Makoto smiled, as if he was unsure how to respond, and said, Well, I guess you're right. I guess you're right. But you also saved my life many times during these past two years, and 
Makoto took a deep, quiet breath and smiled at Mukuro again. You're my friend. We all spent time with each other. It would be great if you could look for a different path, not despair. And if there's any way I can help you, I will. Do you really think I can walk another path at this point? I don't know what you can do, or even what you can do, but I think it's more important to look for that path instead of actually finding it. Was this intentional or coincidence? Just before he regained his memories, Makoto had said something similar to Mukuro when she spoke to him in the nurse's office as Junko. Regardless of whether he lost his memories or regained them, those words revealed Makoto's true character. As Mukuro confirmed that to herself, Makoto blurted out something that was almost too trusting. And it's not just you. Even Junko can. But he was immediately interrupted. Monokuma's face appeared on every monitor in the academy, and his laughter seemed to be coming out of every speaker. I could have kept pretending to be the that, that I could have kept pretending to be that ultimate hacker, but it's boring to impersonate someone who doesn't even exist. If this keeps up, I'll lose my identity and turn into Kono Konokuma. Kyoko looked up at the surveillance camera and addressed Monokuma directly. You seem to give up pretty easily. There isn't a bear anywhere that gives up as easily as I do. Regardless, I'm pretty sure Chahiro has figured out the secret of my control program by now. So just as I thought, you included that program on purpose. Kyoko realized something when Mukuro told her about Junko. There were two reasons. There were two reasons such a hateful person would intentionally leave an obvious clue inside the Monokuma units. Either Junko wanted the students to learn the truth about the outside world and themselves on their own and turn their hopes into despair. I read that all wrong. Either Junko wanted the students to learn the truth about the outside world and themselves on their own and turn their hopes into, this, into despair, or she was looking forward to that clue resulting in her own plan being undone, which would allow her to feel despair toward herself. She was an angel of everlasting darkness, delighting in her own despair and using it to spread despair and destruction to those around her. Why would someone like that continue to play the role of Monokuma? Actually, I set that program for, Ch for Chahiro to discover if she happened to be one of the final five survivors. I feel so sad and empty that my preparations was a uh, waste, but I'm going to think about it positively. The word retreat doesn't exist in Monokuma's dictionary. Nervousness began to gripe. Nervousness began to grip the students as Monokuma continued talking in his relaxing, uplifting voice. Now then, it looks like everyone's here, including Toko, who's still tied up in her room. So let's start the heart-throbbing, exciting, special graduation exam! I totally forgot that Toko was tied up. <laughs> huh? The students broke out in noisy confusion, but Monokuma ignored them and kept talking. Don't think about it too hard! Relax, relax! Change, relax, to loop it! What? Change Elax to Upert? I have no idea how I'm supposed to pronounce that. Okay. Change Elax to Rupert. For all I care, I'll still be the most adorable bear here. Byakia, visibly annoyed with Monokuma's nonsensical rambling, shouted, I already know it's you, Junko. Stop this stupid game and show yourself. Oh my, don't you know? If you want to lure the mastermind out of her heavenly hidey hole, you need to bring a worthy sacrifice. You're not worthy enough at all. 
Do you really think the mastermind would show herself for your pathetic hope and despair? <laughs> he roared manically and began to explain the special graduation exam. If you pass my exam, everyone will graduate. But if you fail, you'll be held back for a whole year. I'll reset your memories, give you a fresh new lease on life, and you'll reintroduce yourselves as the at the start of the school year again. They say people, they say people's lives don't come with reset buttons, but I'm not a people. Whether it's soft resets or hard resets, I can do as I please. Yasuhiro seemed confused, but the other students knew what Monokuma meant by reset. He was going to force them to relive their school lives once again. As Yasuhiro struggled to understand, Taka pointed at a nearby monitor and shouted, Stop this already! No matter what you do to us, we'll never commit murder. These past few days should have already made that clear to you. What was that? jumped Monokuma. Are you serious? Of course! No one here would ever take another human being's life for any reason! <laughs> As Saka shouted, one of the students, a pale-faced girl standing apart from the others, looked away. It was Sayaka. She trembled, her voice popped up from behind her. What do you think, Sayaka? She couldn't even turn around from sheer terror, but Sayaka knew. She knew Monokuma was standing right behind her. Do you really think none of you will become a killer? Monokuma leaned towards Sayaka and asked her a question only she could hear. By the way, Sayaka, why did you go to Makoto's room when nothing strange had happened yet? Did you two have an inappropriate relationship? What would your fans think if they found out you made a move on a boy by sneaking into his room? Or were you there for some other reason? Uh, I... She could barely make a sound, much less scream, as her trembling worsened. Monokuma had nothing to gain by cornering Sayaka and toying with her emotions like this. He simply wanted to see the younger young singer fall into, into despair over her true character. And for that reason, Munakuma did not relent. Hey, hey! What are you trying to do to your close friend you've known for the past two years? <sighs> her determination from last night blended with the memories Makoto had recounted and ate away at Sayaka's mind like a disease. As her mind began to rip itself apart, she fell to her knees. A clear ball flying at just under 105 miles per hour struck Monokuma in the mouth with enough force to sink into his face. The speaker in Monokuma's mouth was immediately destroyed as his body rolled, sorry, as his body rolled into a wall and stopped moving. Sayaka came to her senses and looked where the ball came flying from. She saw Leon breathing heavily as he stared intensely at Monokuma. Yasuhiro grabbed him and yelled, Oh, dude, why'd you do that, Leon? That crystal ball is really valuable! Leon had stolen Yasuhiro's crystal ball and thrown it at Monokuma. That Monokuma bastard was trying to take Sayaka hostage. What was I supposed to do? Dude, that crystal ball cost me two trillion dollars! Two trillion! They don't even print that much money anymore! Oh, bullshit. Besides, if the world is all screwed up, what the hell are you going to need money for anyway? But if it's safe out there, I'll just join the major leagues or whatever and pay you back. Uh, well, I could pay you back doing something else besides baseball. As those two argued, Saka fell to her knees. Hey! shouted Leon, running towards her. Saka, are you okay? She looked at him and stared blankly. Leon. She made up her mind as she raised her head as she said, Um, there's something I need to confess to you later. What? S seriously? Seiko was staring at Leon so intensely that he briefly forgot about the current situation. Not just you, but to Makoto and the others too. 
Seka had made up her mind to confess the sin that was weighing heavily on her heart, but Leon seemed not to hear the latter half of her remark. He ran back to the other, slapped. <laughs> okay. He ran back to the other, slapped Hifumi and Yasuhiro on their backs and shouted, "All right, everyone, let's ace this exam or whatever and get out of here already." There's no way I'm going to let my happy memories of this place get taken away. The Monokuma inside the monitor responded, Fine, fine. Now that the things are finally coming to a boil, let's start the graduation exam. Sakura, who had been outside the dormitory, suddenly appeared with some information. The Monokumas in the hallways are acting peculiar. The students all moved to the main building to see what Sakura was talking about. There, they saw 50 Monokuma standing in two rows along the walls of the hallway, and one standing at the very end of the hall. There's something strange on top of this Monokuma's head, an enlarged version of the escape button that Makoto had obtained from the Monomono machine. As each student took in the sight, an announcement rang throughout the school. The me at the end of the hall has a button on the top of his head that'll open the main entrance. You'll have 15 seconds to get to that button, and if you do, I'll let you have it in place of a diploma. The students seemed surprised by the straightforward explanation. Only Celeste remained calm as she asked Monokuma with a bored look on her face. Of course, it is not as simple as running up and taking it, is it? <laughs> Ooh, how mean! Do I look the kind of head? Do I look? Do I look the kind of headmaster that would interfere with his students' graduation? Forget the gunfire salutes. I want to send my students off with some fireworks. One hundred fireworks, to be exact. Enough for twenty seconds of hardcore partying. More perceptive students immediately realized what he was talking about. The bombs installed inside each monokuma. They would explode one after the other, filling the hallway with fire as soon as time started. After 15 seconds, the me standing at the back of the hall is going to sacrifice himself to give you why to give you guys one final firework. By the way, this probably isn't important, but that button isn't very durable. <laughs> Miss graduation exam was Monokuma's way of saying that he had no intention of letting anyone leave. It was clear from the explosion the students saw during the entrance exam that the halls of Hope's Peak Academy would be bathed in fire. Even if someone was lucky enough to survive the explosion, survive the explosions, the burn on their body alone would the burn on, the burns on their body alone would be enough to send them into a fatal shock. Their lungs might be completely incinerated by the scorched air before that. Even if they sacrificed one student to run through, the odds were low that they would even succeed. But there was no reason for every student to run in at, at once either, and a shadow of despair fell upon their faces. Nice! Very nice! I almost want to take a picture so I have these faces as a souvenir! As Monokuma laughed from behind the monitor, Sakura stepped forward. I'll do it. I have only seen the explosion once, but I believe I'm capable of withstanding its power. No! <clears throat> shouted Aoi. You can't! Even if... Even you couldn't handle hundreds of those explosions... Sakura shook her head. I'm the only one who even has a chance. Suddenly, Mondo remembered the motorcycle he parked inside the dormitory and said, Hold up. That motorcycle might be fast enough to go through those explosions. I'll do it. Don't be hasty, urged Sakura. Even if the motorcycle is unharmed by the explosions, that doesn't mean its, riders will, its rider will be. As Sakura and the others continued to th their debate, one person stepped toward the hallway lined with monokumas. I'll do it. Mukuro! screamed Makoto weakly. Ma ma why does it say Makuro? Mukuro! Mukuro, with her back facing Makoto, turned her head to the side slightly and gave him a small nod. She knew it would come to this. 
She knew why Monokuma would pose such an impossible exam. Junko is already looking forward to the next despair game. She's going to erase everyone's memories, including mine. She just wants to torment us and fill us with despair before that happens. But Mukuro knew her sister's personality all too well, and that's why she was confident. She knew that the escape button was real. Whenever Junko brought despair to others, she always made sure there was a possibility that despair would befall her instead. If the students won the scamble and made it through this horrible situation, they would finally escape to the outside world. That outcome would obviously fill Junko with immense despair. In the same way she left a clue in Monokuma's control program, Junko could not be satisfied unless she took pains to assure her own destruction. It was this quality that made Junko the ultimate despair. That's why Mukuro was determined to do it. She knew she was the only person who stood a chance of making that outcome possible, even if she had to risk her life. But right now, Mukuro wanted to live more than anything. She wanted to hold on to this world, a world she had no interest in previously. She didn't even know if this hesitation she felt was disappointing or not. But she wanted to live and continue searching for a new path. A path where she could abandon her submission to despair. Where she could accept the sins of the past and continue to live. Mukuro, who was known as a war machine, found her heart beset by overwhelming fear and anxiety. Until now, she had never, it had never occurred to her that determination was necessary to live. As if she was brushing that fear aside, she quietly said, Um, thank you, Makoto. Unfortunately, the words she said to the boy who showed her new possibilities never reached his ears. Sakura, however, heard her and frowned as she said, If you're planning to sacrifice yourself as an act of penance, I'll stop you with all my power. Through her words, though her words were firm, there was unmistakable affection hiding in them. Both girls had dedicated their lives to battle, and yet Mukuro felt a twinge of jealousy towards Sakura for possessing something she lacked. Mukuro leaned towards Sakura and whispered in her ear, What? Are you serious? As Sakura... As Sakura's frown intensified, Monokuma's voice blared throughout the halls. All right, I'm starting the exam now. Ready, set, go! There was no time for questions or objections. The frontmost Monokuma exploded, sending a roaring wave of heat through the hall. But Mukuro didn't look away. She began moving, powered by resolute determination. Okay. Monokuma Room. As soon as the graduation exam started, the mastermind focused her control entirely on the Monokuma holding the escape button and completely synchronized her field of vision with it. She knew what was going to happen next. She could predict what her sister Mukuro would do in this exact situation, where she would choose to focus her superhuman skill with weaponry. And so, through Monokuma's eyes, she watched the scene unfold exactly as she had predicted. A pointed metal bar burst through the explosions, heading straight for the weak point of the Monokuma holding the escape button. Specific specifically, it was aiming for the point where the bomb's detonation system and Monokuma's power source overlapped. It flew straight and true as if it had been fired by a master archer. In order to bring despair to Monokuma, and by extension Junko as well, super soldier known as Mukuro Ikusaba threw the pipe like a spear so it could attack the same weak point she had pierced in the nurse's office. As explosions filled the hallway until only fire remained visible, the spear's, the spear's speed and precision as it soared to its target defied all human logic. But the mastermind knew. She knew Mukuro had used her power to fill the world with despair. Power was all that disappointing girl had. But that power was useless against Monokuma. 
The mastermind had predicted that Mukuro would put all her effort into that throw, and Monokuma caught the metal bar perfectly between his hands. The force of the throw knocked Monokuma back several yards, but the pointed end of the bar never pierced through his chest. Well, that was disappointing. The mastermind turned to look, or maybe I should probably do that in Juku, Juko's voice. Well, that was disappointing. The mastermind turned to look at a different monitor. She wanted to see the look on Mukuro's face as she realized that she failed to strike Monokuma. The despair seen the final Monokuma explode right before her eyes, completely obliterating the escape button. She wanted to sear this memory of her disappointing sister's final moments as, she re as her newfound hope sank into a dark pit of despair. An instinct, she turned her attention to the surveillance camera that hadn't been destroyed, but instead of seeing Mukuro and the others, she only saw Sakura, who looked as though she had finished launching an attack. She only thought it was strange for one second. But then the hopelessly powerful mastermind completely understood the situation and shifted her point of view to Monokuma. But because of that single second, Junko would feel just a pang of despair. Ready? Three seconds left. Amid the smoke, flames, and heat encircling the hallway, it burst through with the speed of a cannon shell. It glared at Monokuma with hot, boiling eyes that betrayed their icy expression on its face, and then, sharply, swiftly, strongly, it transformed into a living weapon that cuts through everything, revealing its true form in the hall, in that hall of despair. Two seconds left. Monokuma, who was still holding the metal bar in his hands, tried to move, but at that exact moment, the living weapon carved the path through the flames and appeared before him. Its body, which had never been wounded on any battlefield, was sustaining all manners of burns and injuries. But even so, it did not falter. The fire in its eyes never flickered once. One second left. The living weapon, Mukuro, slammed her knee into the back of the metal bar Monokuma was holding. The sharp tip of that metal bar pierced through Monokuma like a rail spike, shredding the, den shredding the detonator and its his power source into pieces. Time's up. The 100 explosions ceased and smoke blanketed the hallway. Mukuro had dived into Monokuma and the pristine escape button now rested in her hand. She and the other students of Hope's Peak Academy had passed the graduation exam. It was only a small amount of despair. When Akuma had tasted it in only three seconds. First floor, hallway. Junko. Mukuro looked down at Munokuma. He could no longer move or self-destruct. When she spoke to him, a static-filled voice emitted from his mouth. It seemed his communication functions still worked. I never expected you to do that. He still sounded like Monokuma. It seems his voice modulator was unharmed as well. I must have overestimated you. I never thought you'd need anybody's help on the battlefield. Oh. When I give the signal, please launch me forward with a roundhouse kick. Mikuro whispered these words to Sakura just before the explosion started. After Mukuro threw the metal bar, she jumped into the air that jumped into the air at the exact moment Sakura unleashed a roundhouse kick. Right when Sakura's foot made contact with her own, Mukuro used the force generated by her kick to propel herself at Monokuma. Using the ultimate martial arts using the ultimate martial arts artist's superhuman attack like a springboard, she shot herself through the air like an artil artillery shell. Artillery. I can't say that word right now. Enduring intense heat, shrapnel, and blood-draining G-force, she, she stayed conscious as she charged through the hallway engulfed with explosions and despair. Mukuro trusted Junko. She trusted Junko to predict that she'd throw the metal bar and catch it accordingly. Then she tried, then she tried to look at her face as the despair sets in. The Junko Inoshima she knew would definitely do that. 
Although Mukuro hadn't predicted that her sister would try to kill her with the spears of Gunnir, she had a better understanding of her actions now. As Mukuro stared Monokuma in the face, all he could do was laugh scornfully. You put your life in someone else's hand for a deadly battle? I don't know how I feel about that. You'll always be a half-assed disappointment. I guess this time I'll just say I lost because I didn't see that much disappointment coming. The end, the end. Mukuro shook her head at Monokuma. No, you're wrong, Junko. Huh? If you want to talk about winning or losing, I think we lost even before, before we even started. Mukuro's eyes shifted from side to side as if she was unsure of something and she fidgeted in place as she continued to talk. No matter how much despair they felt, you didn't think they'd kill each other the way they were before. That's why you erased their memories. They aren't like the others you forced in the past. You knew these students would never do it. That's why you believed, isn't it? What are you talking about? So, um... It's okay, Junko. I'll bring back everyone's memories someday, and I'll show you everyone's happiness and their bonds. I'll show all that to you, and fill you with even more despair. Mugolo nodded after she said this, as if to cheer her sister up. After several seconds of silence, Monokuma responded, You finally beat me this one time, and that lame speech is the best you can do? You're such a disappointment! You never fill me with despair. It's just a, just constant disappointment. After pouting like a sore loser, Monokuma continued to speak in his usual tone. But you guys will be back. And when that time comes, I'll invite you guys to a wonderful place. I found out about this fun island while I was running things here. <laughs> Monokuma's laughter filled the room before the static finally cut out, and his remains and his remains fell silent. He wouldn't be talking again anytime soon. The mastermind was already preparing a new despair to bring to the world and to the students of Hope's Peak Academy, Junko included. In the end, the mastermind stayed in her Monokuma persona until the very end, and Junko Inoshima never showed her face again. It was as if she resented the despair Mukuro had given her. That thought almost filled Mukuro with despair. But when she heard her classmates calling for her, she sealed that despair deep into the depths of her heart. From now on, she would seal away all her despair. And one day, when she can give Junko the perfect despair, she will unleash all that despair she'd stored and plunged with her sister into a dark abyss. I won't leave my little sister alone. In the end, that was the first hope. That was the first hope the disappointing older sister had felt since she was a child. Okay. I'm gonna assume this next part might be the epilogue. So, small break. I wonder. <laughs> okay, you're right. Let's continue reading. Several hours later, main entrance. Yeah. Mukuro, are you really going out wearing that wig? After receiving a blood transfusion of the correct blood type, Makoto was beginning to show signs of recovering. Mukuro, holding her wig to disguise herself as Junko Inoshima, nodded. If I live as Junko, I might be able to understand her better. Despite that, Mukuro's voice still sounded like her own, as if she hadn't fully decided. And I've made up my mind. While I'm out there, I've decided I'll accept everyone's hatred toward me and toward Junko. 
I can't die until I've destroyed all the despair that Juko has spread. The damage that that ultimate despair inflicted upon the world cannot be measured in terms of money, culture, or even human life. Sorry, I don't know if this is... Did she finish talking on? Television... Okay, sorry, this is the narrator, okay. The damage that ultimate despair inflicted upon the world could not be measured in terms of money, culture, or even human life. Television broadcasts had already began, begun informing people that Jinko Inoshima and Mukuro Ikosaba were the heart of ultimate despair. Among the survivors in the outside world, there are still people who hadn't been tainted by despair yet. Regardless of the fact that she released Makoto and the others, to these survivors she was nothing more than the reason the world ended. And to the terrorists wearing Monokuma masks who continued to ravage the world, Mukuro was nothing but a traitor. She was now in the hopeless situation of being enemies with most of humanity, but Mukuro wasn't making a big deal out of it. I'm going to try. Not to kill anyone who comes after me for revenge. Wouldn't it be safer to just turn yourself in? Wondered Yasuhiro. Well, you might just get executed instead. But you could live to be an old lady if your trial keeps getting pushed back. Mikuro slowly shook her head at Yasuhiro. Laws, justice, these things no longer exist. <laughs> Is it really that bad out there? <laughs> Maybe we should just stay in here. Byakia glared at Yasuhiro with contempt. Ignorant idiots should just shut up. Your fate won't change whether you stay in here or not. Though he was shocked to learn the Togami Corporation had been destroyed, Byakuya continued to remain firm and proud, even toward Makuro. Mukuro. You are a rare asset, continued Byakuya, so I will let you live for now. Depending on your actions, I may consider forgiving your crimes after I've built a new world. Only a Togami would boast that they're capable of forgiving the crime of ending the world. You don't need to do that. I don't plan on just surviving. After turning away from Byakia, Byakia, Mukuro looked at the other students. Everyone was reacting in their own way. Kyoko had a look of quiet preparation. Toko, having just changed back from Genocide Jack, was panicked and confused. Mukuro looked back on the two years she spent with them then turned to Makoto, who shared the same memories as her, and gave him the escape button. Makoto, you should press it. Huh? Me? I think it's better if you press it instead of me. As she watched Makoto accept the button with some hesitation, Mukuro thought about what Monokuma had said. You guys will be back. Mukuro knew that Monokuma was telling the, telling the truth. After all, the file the students needed to fully restore their lost memories remained hidden in the academy. The research notes of Yasuke, Yasuke Matsuda, the ultimate neurologist. His research is the key to restoring everyone's memories. Even if the students no longer have their memories, they may be able to repair the bonds they had built among themselves over the past two years. And as long as their memories remain unrestored, the mastermind could still repeat her deadly plan. Although the island mentioned earlier, although the island mentioned earlier sounded strange, the students could not turn their backs on the despair facing them. Then, let's go. Makoto remembered everything that was happening in the outside world. The boy who had chosen to remain inside the academy two years ago was now choosing to leave. How much did he struggle to come to that decision? But he was determined to face the despair awaiting him outside and hid his internal conflict from the others. 
By protecting Makoto's hope, Mukuro would bring despair to her beloved sister. But she no longer knew if the end result of her goal would lead to hope or despair. She pulled the wig over her head and hid her face with her hands. Was she smiling because hope was waiting for her? Or was she crying because her path would lead to despair? When she lowered her hands, her face was devoid of all emotion. Mukuro, Mukuro no longer knew what expression she would wear on her face. At the same time, Makoto pressed the escape button. A siren began to wail as the turrets retracted into the ceiling. From beyond the heavy door, a bright light appeared. An infinite number of ifs, and all the possibilities contained therein encased the world. Accepting everything, hope, despair, and even the feelings of that disappointing girl, Mukuro Ikusaba. All right, okay, that was it. There we go, that is Danganronpa, the light novel if uh, for tr Danganronpa Trigger Happy Havoc. So thank God the epilogue wasn't extremely long. Just, I'm just, I'm having, <laughs> I guess, PTSD from like, I think it's like this game and the previous game. But mostly, I feel like the previous game, if I'm remembering correctly. I clearly, I know like my wires have been crossed for some characters from both games. But either way, this was it for that. I think now this officially is the final stuff, extra content that I have that is here for this game. Because um, otherwise, everything else is just yeah, our gallery vending machine stuff like that. And then this, obviously this one, but then I'm not going to play that because it's exactly the same as the the thing from the first game. The mini game <laughs> from the first game. So either way, um, yeah. I do not know what I'm going to play after this. That said, uh, the Steam sale is currently running, so... Maybe one of the new games I bought will be played next, which I don't think I've <laughs> I don't think I've put in the community post which games I've, I've I've purchased and can still purchase. Either way, thank you for liking if you liked, thank you for commenting if you commented, thank you for subscribing if you subscribed, thank you for simply clicking on this video. New content for old content. <laughs> Either way, until next time, guys. See ya.